Uh, welcome uh, to the session 11 of uh, epilepsy surgery case by case, step by step, uh, media uh, frontal lobe epilepsy. Uh, I'm uh, Kensuke Kawai from Japan, co convener of this webinar. Uh, this webinar uh, is uh, part uh, of activities of Epilepsy Surgery Task Force, uh, 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 International League Against Epilepsy, Asia, Oceania. Uh, we are trying to reduce uh, the treatment gap of epilepsy uh, in Asian Oceania region. And uh, this is the 11th session. And uh, this time uh, the topic is uh, media frontal lobe epilepsy. And uh, first, uh, let me introduce our faculty, uh, the uh, Professor John Dunn, uh, Chair of ILE Asia Oceania. Unfortunately, he is uh, the absent today. And uh, Professor uh, the Akio Ikeda, uh, Pastor Chair uh, of uh, ILE uh, Asia Oceania. And Professor Salat Chandra, uh, Co-Chair of Epilepsy Surgery Task Force and a strong promoter uh, of this uh, the, uh, webinar. And uh, a case will be presented by our faculty, uh, Professor uh, Manjari uh, Toripachi. And uh, we'll have uh, variable uh, comments and didactic lectures from two guest fa uh, faculties, the Professor Aileen uh, McGonigal and uh, Professor uh, Javanesa Raman, uh, uh, whose detailed uh, the CV will be introduced uh, later by uh, the Professor Sarat Chandra. Okay, uh, then uh, the, uh, Sarat, uh, please uh, the, uh, start your uh, the, uh, the explanation. Thank you so much, Kensuke, and thank you very much for us reaching to this session 11th of epilepsy surgery case by case. And before we proceed, I would request Professor Akio Ikeda to say a few words. All right, could you hear me? Yes, uh, we can. Afternoon. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon and a good evening for the ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, welcome for this the uh, epilepsy surgery, case by case and step by step. So the, it is the very uh, the, uh, good for us to have uh, today that the 11th uh, the, uh, time of this activity. Uh, so far, we had the uh, really the hot discussion in the covering the major temporal and the lateral temporal, and then we move on to that the frontal. So the that would be in each time that we had the very good discussion uh, with uh, all of us, and then especially a uh, good uh, the the guest uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the professor at uh, today's. We are very pleased to have uh, uh, the uh, professor Ali Magonial and then professor. Uh, Zebuna uh, de Rama. Uh, so we are looking for very much. Unfortunately, for both of you, supposed to be there late at night, but I hope that the, we could have the, a very good discussion. And then I hope that you, all of us, including you, have a, a quite good sleep uh, this uh, tonight. So looking for very much. And then always uh, appreciate that the uh, good coordination and the, the preparation by the Indi Indian. Uh, uh, institute uh, led by that the Professor Sarachandra. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Ikeda. Uh, let me share my slides so that I could do the proper introductions. So this is a session 11 for epilepsy surgery case by case and uh, step by step. And uh, uh, we have the pleasure of having two very well-renowned faculty from Australia. And I would like to give a brief introduction to each one of them. Uh, Professor Eileen McGonigal. Your slides have disappeared. Yes, uh, the problem is when I show the slides, I'm not able to see the CV. So I'll have to disable the slides so that I can read out the CV. So Professor Eileen McGonigal is the Director of Epilepsy Unit, Mater Hospital, Brisbane, and Honorary Professor and Faculty of Medicine, University of Queensland. She's a neurologist with extensive experience in epileptology and EEG, including stereo EEG. Following UK neurology training, Professor McGonigal spent many years in Marseille, France, one of the world's leading centers for epileptology, where she studied and practiced stereo EEG methodology, contributing to its evolution through clinical research. Her research interests include clinical seizure semiology and its neural correlates, and she has written several articles and has very widely lectured on this. She has taken up her current post in Australia in 2022 and continues to develop the use of stereo EEG with an associated clinical research program. And we uh, really look forward for her active interaction and for her didactic lecture presentation. 
Now, introducing our second faculty, uh, Professor Zebunusa Rahman, who is a staff specialist neurologist, Westmead Hospital, Sydney, Australia. She is an academic lead for education, Westmead Clinical School, Sydney Medical School, University of Sydney, Australia. She is also the advisor for Tuberous Sclerosis Australia. She is a member of Western Sydney Neuro Oncology Multidisciplinary Service, Sydney. And her clinical and research interests include management of complex epilepsy, epilepsy surgery, cortical stimulation mapping, brain tumor related epilepsy, and tuberous sclerosis associated with epilepsy. Her research interests include in brain tumor related to epilepsy and cortical stimulation. Uh, she does a teaching uh, at the Westmead Clinical School, Sydney, University of Sydney. And she is a well known tutor for EEG and epilepsy teaching for masters in neurophysiology. And again, I welcome Dr. Zivunusa for this program, and we are really grateful for both of you for having joined us. And a couple of uh, announcements before we go in for uh, the presentation by Dr. Manjari. So we are very currently, we are grateful to our sponsor, Zipka, uh, who have given us an unrestricted educational grant so that we are able to do this webinar uh, month after month, and we have completed 10 of these webinars. And likewise, we are going to proceed with substrates for epilepsy coming from every part of the brain. And we sincerely hope that this would be very, very useful for our uh, viewers. And now I would like to introduce Dr. Manjari, who is a professor of neurology at the All India Institute of Medical Sciences. And she is also the uh, director uh, and the clinical lead for the MEG Resource Facility. Uh, at which is a collaborative project between the All India Institute and the National Brain Research Center. And she would start presenting us the case. And the case would be for about 45 minutes. And I'll request Manjari to keep it for 45 minutes. And uh, in between, I hope you don't mind if I keep on interrupting regarding the time. And we wish to have a very interactive discussions. So both Eileen, Zeb, as well as uh, Kensuki and Professor Ikida are free to interrupt in between if they want to ask any doubts or they want to ask for more information. The presentation would be in the format as we see in the epilepsy surgery meetings and she would be showing details of all the investigations. So Manjari, you can start presenting. Uh, thank you, at the outset, I'd like to thank Professor Ikeda, Professor John Dunn and Dr. Kenzuke and Sarat uh, to have this series. Um, I discuss here, uh, 48-year-old uh, lady uh, who has been a very, very uh, active person. And she uh, basically manages uh, her husband's business, the office, the back-end accounting, auditing. And uh, she wants to continue working the way uh, she has been doing over several years. However, uh, uh, for two years now, uh, she has... Margarita, uh, sorry that you are showing that the uh, slides or not? Yes, I'm going to show the slides, yeah. Okay, so that's it. A, yeah, are you able to see it? Have you done the share screen? Yeah. Now it's visible. Okay. Now it's up here. So, sorry for that. So she's a 48-year-old lady who's uh, very active and wants to retain her uh, high-performance uh, lifestyle. And uh, she had a history of seizures. The age of onset was around 15 years. And she had these seizures till the age of 19. And she was put on about three anti-seizure medications, uh, uh, one of which was clobazam, and one was phenobarbitone. And uh, there was uh, another which was uh, levetiracetam. Now, um, she had these seizures which were mostly nocturnal from the age of 15 to 19 and somehow suddenly the seizures disappeared and she had a period of quiescence um, till uh, for the next uh, you know few years um, when after a period of 25 to 27 years she had a recurrence and she came to us with this recurrence uh, where she was having uh, recurrent episodes all nocturnal about uh, two to four, sometimes four to five per night. And uh, never uh, in her lifetime, her uh, co-partner in uh, bed, which is her husband, had witnessed any generalized convulsive movements. Uh, the only history which was given by her 
in fact, uh, she was very hesitant coming out of the history and uh, there used to be tears in her eyes is that uh, she would um, have episodes where uh, she would, um, uh, you know, uh, just get up in sleep and uh, she would be incontinent. So this was the only history. And uh, when asked what would wake her up from sleep, she would say that she would feel anxiety and some sens sensation of fear, but not full fear, but there was definitely what in Hindi we call ghabrahat, which is anxiety. And this would make her get up. And uh, by the time she's got up, she would be aware and she would be incontinent. So she was fully aware and fully incontinent. And this was happening about two to four times in the night. The episodes were usually very brief. The husband had never found her to be uh, altered sensorium, had never found her to have any uh, peculiar facial expression, had never found her to be aggressive or agitated in the bed or having any jumping or shouting kind of behavior. So these were pretty much very, very bland. And just starting with this aura, which used to alert her. And by the time she's alerted and awake, she had already been uh, incontinent. And then she would be completely all right. So um, there was no prenatal history and there was, uh, you know, nothing else significant in her past. There was no family history of Caesars, uh, no nocturnal events in the family uh, at all. Uh, she was a hypothyroid and she was on medication and she had uh, a skin condition which is known as lichen planus uh, for which she had taken various topical preparations. She Currently, we gave her carbamazepine, um, uh, though uh, she was on a higher dose when she came to us. Considering the fact that she was hypothyroid, uh, we did bring down the dose a bit and she was on Privaracetam. Uh, we did give her clobazam also, but she was excessively drowsy and it was impacting her daytime performance. And she just refused to take it. So basically, she would refuse to increase carbamazepine or clobazam because of the associated daytime function impairment. So with this history, uh, the hypothesis uh, which we had was that she was having only nocturnal events and they were very brief and uh, she was aware most of the time she could perceive an aura which made her get up from sleep and uh, she was incontinent. Uh, so considering these factors, uh, our uh, hypothesis on the history was definitely uh, a frontal lobe uh, origin of the Caesars. The fact that she was able to respond immediately as told by her husband made us think that these were probably coming from the non-dominant uh, uh, frontal lobe. And the fact that she had bladder involvement right in the beginning made us think that it could be a mesial frontal um, around peri, um, you know, uh, pre prefrontal, premotor SMA kind of localization. So this was basically uh, the semiology which I described to you and uh, um, just uneasiness, anxiety followed by an incontinence in getting up. Neurologically, she was pretty much normal. Her interictal EG, uh, which was done, this is a uh, bipolar montage, showed, uh, if you can see that we are seeing sleep spindles in the fourth second of the epoch here. And then uh, there seems to be some sharp, which is coming on the FP2, which is intervening the spindle. There's some kind of semi-rhythmic activity, but you really can't be sure about this. This is followed by some slowing and it's in sleep. Again, um, we see the sleep spindle and then there are these sharps which come in, uh, which are again anterior frontal FP2 maximum. Also seen on the left over here. Uh, one would tend to worry whether this is actually a sleep activity or um, unlikely they are vertic sharp waves because they are coming in stage two sleep. Um, uh, and um, they are asymmetric. So I would tend to give uh, a significance to these, um, uh, you know, kind of sharps which we see mixed with the sleep activity. Uh, pretty much again here, we are seeing this is a Laplacian montage, which is again showing a right frontal maximum. So this kind of interictal EG uh, kind of gave us a little bit of a uh, clue again that, yes, this is probably a non-dominant uh, frontal lobe. So I show you the events and uh, 
she's obviously in sleep. She comes to know something is happening. She presses the buzzer herself, the event marker. She marks it out herself. Then she's uncomfortable. She's kind of grimacing, but just a slight grimace. And she knows she's past children. And that, that is what kind of upsets her the most. Um, in fact, she had undergone investigations for urinary tract infection and anxiety disorder and all kinds of things before she came to us. So here she is, and uh, she is past urine. And this would pretty much happen in all the seizures. So you can imagine a grown up woman who has this, and the staff nurse is testing her. In Hindi, she's saying Bechani and Kabrahat, which means restlessness and anxiety. She feels restless and anxious. That is when she presses the marker. And then she's by now she's fully okay and she's aware that she's messed up the bed. So this, you know, this is basically that part, and then she's fully responsive. So next event is pretty much the same. Then she's in bed sleep. Again, she gets up, presses the event marker. She's actually aware now that she's already passed the urine. And she presses the event marker. So she pretty much, uh, the event wakes her up from sleep because of this aura that she has of resistance and anxiety. Some little fear and some grimacing and incontinence. And imagine having this four times. So now she's got a Macintosh under her uh, bed so that she doesn't soil the whole bedding. She is uncomfortable. So she has several such events in sleep at, in one night. So, and after that, she's pretty much responsive. So uh, discussing the semiology, um, what we found, uh, we recorded of two nights and um, what we found was that she was uh, having an aura. She was uh, then incontinent and she was pretty much aware and uh, responsive. Uh, she was answering what her aura was uh, during the event and even after the event. And uh, she was responsive. So again, uh, this validates the hypothesis this, that this is a non-dominant uh, frontal lobe, probably very close to the mesial frontal bladder center around the SMA area. Her ictal EEG, um, we can see here that this is actually before she presses the buzzer. So I will I will show you where she presses the buzzer. But this uh, what uh, what we what changes we find in the EEG occur much before she's awake. And as we can see here. Um, this is an average montage, and uh, we see some change in rhythm, uh, which is coming on uh, the central as well as the frontal F8 position. And then there it, it's followed by an activity which kind of looks like a muscle. And this is the next epoch where, uh, you know, you just find some kind of, she's still sleep, asleep. She's not yet awake. We still find, we find some delta with superimposed fast-like activity and this goes on and then quite you have this again intermittent delta and then some attenuation and this this is where um, where is that so this is where she prints presses the event marker so the event um, is marked here so pretty Manjali, much you could, go back, you could go back one slide it's actually written there presses the button and where i saw that could you go back yeah so uh, basically much into what has happened in the eg much later she marks the patient this is a patient event which is marked by herself so here she's awake but all these changes which we find which are very subtle have probably started uh, here. 
So this is the first event. And pretty much after this, she's awake. This is in the circumferential montage, the same activity, which came in when she was asleep. So that was the average. And this is the circumferential. You can find the same uh, funny kind of slowing with some superimposed fast, which comes in this time centrally and FP2 in the circumferential montage. And then, um, you know, we find she's awake. So pretty much this was the activity that we were seeing in the ICTIL uh, EG. Uh, so with this, I'd like to take uh, inputs from uh, Eileen and uh, Zeb as to um, what they would think of uh, this kind of activity. Sure, thanks very much, Manjari. Um, well, it seems a very interesting case. Um, so I agree that um, maybe s starting with the semiology, so um, this aura of anxiety and a restless feeling and then the, the loss of bladder control, um, I think I would agree that orients towards a frontal lobe um, seizure, but I must say I have never seen this pattern with no associated motor features. So I would say that's a kind of unusual feature because of course, the frontal lobe seizures are usually characterized by abnormal movements. It's one of the main um, features that we see. So I'm quite intrigued about why she does not have any abnormal movements. Um, it might make us think of actually quite a focal organization, which does not recruit a motor um, network. Um, I guess the fact that she has this anxious feeling, which is of course a very common aura in frontal prefrontal seizures, but also extra frontal localizations, including temporal lobe and insula and elsewhere. For me, it makes me think of more anterior localizations, so the anterior limbic system structures. Um, on the other hand, as you say, the loss of continence could potentially be something a bit more um, mid uh, mid frontal uh, of the mesial wall, um, with the outflow to the autonomic control of the bladder. Um, in terms of the EEG, I agree; it does look as if they have these these kind of sharp waves around the FP two um, region. So that's interesting. It does help to give us some lateralization because, of course, in the the semiology there doesn't seem to be very strong lateralizing features, although I agree it maybe is more in keeping with non-dominant if she can speak and so on. Um, I guess it's of interest that we're discussing these mesial wall because as I'll show later and I'm sure Zeb will also show, often the, the surface EEG is not very clear, not very lateralizing, whereas in this case we do seem to have clear-cut right-sided changes. Um, and then it's interesting to see this um, fast activity appearing several seconds before the patient presses the button. Um, so that that's, I guess we shouldn't rule out the possibility that this could be temporal lobe and then propagating to frontal. That's another possibility when you see a long, a long period of EEG change before the semiology. It can sometimes make us think of a, a propagation from another lobe towards the frontal lobe. Um, so I think I would keep that in my mind as well. Those are my first thoughts on looking at the case. Yeah, uh, just to add on, it's, it's, it's an excellent case. I've never seen anything like that. <laughs> uh, puzzling though. Um, I agree with all the points um, uh, Aileen just mentioned. Um, the anxiety perhaps, yeah, is a, is a limbic uh, in uh, the anterior cingulate cortex is a part of it. Uh, when you talk about the bladder incontinence, that's again a autonomic dysfunction. And we know that the anterior cingulate is, is uh, responsible for that as well. But at the same time, uh, historically, the patient was seizure before years. And that's very unusual for frontal of epilepsy to me. Uh, that what we see in a, in a temple of epilepsy, though, patient could be seizure free uh, for years uh, before having the second in you know, other hit. Uh, so we need to be open minded and think uh, could it be more of a, you know, that we're talking about? To mesial temporal, uh, or you know, the limbic, uh, you know, the region and spreading uh, is, is hard to know. Uh, but there is a little bit of discrepancy. But anterior single edge is a possibility 
at the same time, I think the Mizil Temple of is a possibility. Professor Kida? Yes, uh, could you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I essentially agree for both uh, for both of the, both of uh, both of you, and uh, I would like to point it out that the finding in each of them is not so convergent. Uh, this uh, some of them is the contradictory. So the one of them is that the 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 seizure happened always at the at night, but it never generalized. The, uh, that could be the consistent with the frontal lobe epilepsy, but the frontal frontal lobe epilepsy can easily get generalized. The second thing is that the, the patient have some sort of anxious feeling, which could be all right to say that the anterior, the cingulate and so on, but the, and the patient may have the so-called facial grimace, but so, that is the only the, the very traceable motor symptoms. So in case of the anterior cingulate, it can sometimes have sort of the fidgeting movement or some sort of motor movement, but it never happened. But the presence of the sound the facial agreements may be consistent. And also the incontinence is now the <clears throat> very close to the paracentral lobe or somewhere in the major frontal. So that is also the consistent. Then the EG wise, uh, this the transverse montage is very useful to see that the, the very clearly distinguish between the signal and the artifact. That when we pay much more attention to the CZ or the FZ, which is very distant from that the EMG artifact generator, but nevertheless that CZ and FZ never show that sort of the very uh, the clear ICTA patterns and so on. But otherwise, that the EG is much more uh, some sort of a mixture of a sharp transient or some EMG artifact. So uh, that that can suggest that uh, the seizure focus may be quite distant from that the vertex area. So I, I feel that the, taking all these kind of findings is that although some the uh, controversy was present, but the patient seizure focus may be very deep, such as the anterior cingulate, and it can easily spread to that the placental lobe, making some sort of uh, the uh, the the uh, urinary incontinence. But I don't know why that it it make that so the clear uh, motor uh, artifact or generalized. So that's what I have some sort of uh, a concern. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kida. I, I found this, uh, you know, prolonged duration again, intriguing, at least uh, the electrographic signature seemed to be longer than the clinical uh, signature of the patient. So that was something which was uh, very, very uh, fascinating for me too. And the explanation I gave for it was that probably it's deep seated. And by the time she has this aura, it kind of spreads to the other limbic structures. So the aura of anxiety and, uh, and uh, you know, restlessness uh, could be that it's uh, going to the temporal or to the other limbic structures, which is causing it. Uh, of course, we can explain everything from the cingulate. So the prominent manifestations seem to be the bladder. And that was one, one which was distressing her. She was uh, uh, distress for the fact that, you know, if, if she has these four times in the night, every time she has to get up and change and the whole sleep goes for a six, the husband's sleep goes for a six and the next daytime performance is totally, uh, you know, uh, difficult for her to function in the office and carry out uh, because of which she was getting irritable during work hours uh, at the workers, etc. cetera. So, um, uh, so looking at this uh, prominent bladder, uh, you know, incontinence with awareness, uh, again, uh, we placed uh, the hypothesis to be the mesial frontal, and we know that the periaqueductal gray uh, in the uh, brainstem has uh, inputs uh, from the cortex as well as from the spinal cord. So, um, obviously, uh, there's uh, something happening uh, which is triggering off uh, the cortical, uh, you know, reflexes uh, and causing a disinhibited uh, uh, bladder. Looking at uh, from where it could be coming from, we know both grade uh, group three and group four of Bonini's uh, do have the uh, anterior cingulate involvement and. Uh, uh, each one of them has very typical manifestations, which we've gone through in the previous webinars. But if you look at uh, the bladder, it's uh, more likely to be in group four. 
Um, so, um, Bonidi wise, I don't know um, to place her, but I would have to place her either in group four or maybe group three. Mm. And with this, uh, we went ahead with a neuropsychological evaluation and uh, that pretty much shows uh, she was a very high functioning individual. And uh, in fact, uh, she was, uh, all her uh, performances were pretty good. Her verbal learning memory were intact, visual spatial functioning was intact, her attentional process was intact. And of course she had some anxiety and depressive features over this illness uh, associated. Um, which sequence would you all like to see? Uh, I have coronal T1. I have uh, eggshell T1. I have Saj. Um, I, suggest, I suggest you run all of them at least once so okay. that the viewers can have a look at that. Okay. Okay, so I go with coronal T1. And if any faculty want to see them again, we could run it again. Or we could stop at any position they want us to stop. So this is where I would stop. So uh, we do see something here. We have to see whether it's ratified in the other sections. So I go to the next picture. I think it's good to suggest it and go directly to it from here. That's pretty much evident. So here is the lesion which we see here. And we see it in one section. So it starts somewhere here. You can see it starts somewhere here. Even before the sagittal flare? Yeah. Thanks. Just show the coronal, then the sagittal. So we'll go to the Sajayati. Manjari, does she have some other um, areas of increased signal? Apart she, from does the main have, she does have small um, unidentified bright signals, which are seen, uh, as we could see. Uh, we can yeah. see one here, and we can see one here. So there was this posterior periventricular bright signal, as well as a little bit above, too. So... Mm -hmm. Just in that increasing late, isn't it? She doesn't have any other, uh, you know, uh, signals along the corpus callosum, which you would expect in a multiple sclerosis or demyelinating lesion. Uh, there's not been any other history which is uh, suggestive of vision loss or paraparesis or so yeah so there was one UBO in the frontal which can be seen here and there were two at the posterior very small uh, 
lesions, but nothing like Dawson's fingers or so here you can see uh, the lesion can, again. Can I ask one question? Yes, sir. Uh, that I understand that the patient initially had the uh, seizure for uh, two years, but afterwards, after 19, the patient didn't have any seizure uh, until the, the 27. Then it's yes. now recurred again. So even though some medication worked pretty well, but I think that the, he has the uh, quite a big difference of the seizure free and then the seizure active periods. So that may usually in general suggest that the, that the patient like these can suffer from some sort of uh, self-limited autoimmune epilepsy. So I'm just wondering that the patient or some the uh, the family history have some sort of autoimmune uh, uh, some she, the, she did, the disease like this. She did have hypothyroidism, but she had her TPO antibodies were normal. And uh, in refractory epilepsy, particularly if there is psychiatric comorbidity, like anxiety, and uh, we do our autoimmune workup, which is uh, generally a VGKC, Casper, and LGI-1. So these three with the TPO were negative for her. So the, since she suffered from the hypothyroidism, I'm just wondering that the, she may have some sort of fragmented feature of uh, so-called Hashimoto encephalitis and so on. That, that, that is my idea, some trivial concerns at this moment. Okay. So the thing is that there were no triphasics in the EG. There was no myoclonus. And uh, yes, it is intriguing that she was quiescent for so long. Uh, but when you went and asked her retrospectively, uh, really, if she didn't have any bedwetting, uh, you know, four to five episodes per night, she said maybe she had a little bit of urgency where she had to go to the loof early faster than usual but she never had this incontinence episodes and the incontinence was pretty episodic in the daytime there was never any incontinence it's only in the night where she gets this aura and then she has the incontinence which is an aware incontinence so um it's considering the fact that she was on carbamazepine for a long duration for all these years, she was on carbamazepine. That is how we explained her hypothyroidism. And she was like on 800 milligram BD when she came to us. And we had to reduce it because of the hypothyroidism. And uh, the thyroid did correct itself. There was also some hyponatremia, which corrected itself because of the carbamazepine. So pretty much uh, the hypothyroidism, we explained rather from an autoimmune perspective to be a drug-induced perspective because of the long duration, several years of carbamazepine use so there are a couple of questions coming in from the audience so one question is the is there a coexistent left mts so could we run the call sections again yeah i thought there is some increased signal as well mm. to the left So I'll take it back. So generally, we compare it with the signal of the insula. So it looks pretty much same. So our radiologist says that if the signal in the hippocampus and the signal in the insula is matching, then uh, we would uh, tend to not uh, say it is hyper intense or there is a signal change. So you can see the insula here and you can see this. It looks pretty much comparable. It's not more than that of the corresponding section insula. So uh, we did not think uh, there was an MPS uh, and our radiologist was also of the same opinion. Another few questions, Manjari. Yeah. So uh, the question is that T5 also had some ectal activity. That has been the question. So did you find any activity in the T5? T5, I'm not sure. I did not find anything. The EG. Like so, this is, this is in the circumferential montage, T5, there is, I don't know, I, I found this to be of a proceeding sharp with some fast activity. So this focal kind of fast, I was more focused on to that. And the semiology being nocturnal and... Uh, um, I would not uh, think it was T5 at all. Uh, Prosecida, 
Any comments on the P5? Yes, the, uh, when we carefully look at that, the some of them, uh, some of these, the, yeah, uh, 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 the, I finally could not take any the specific ICTA pattern from T5 because that the some delta-like activity can happen, but it is not so running longer, but just only one uh, less than one second and so. And then the uh, either in the uh, right front or the left front or that. Uh, the temporal in the left and right, I could not find that any specific finding at this moment, yeah. Yeah, so remember she's in sleep uh, and in sleep you would find slowing. So, um, you know, you uh, would have to take that into account. So I would say that there is slowing here and there is slowing here and it's seen on both sides. As Professor says, I would not put uh, cognizance to that being an ictal rhythm. Yeah, but it's it's something which uh, has been noticed, and that's great. So, um, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think in order to avoid that any misleading, uh, first of all, we had better take that the any finding as specific as possible. But yeah. if we fail, that we could uh, the makes that the our the vision to be a uh, more sensitive. So the, the comments could be the very important for the second trial to see that the any finding because that we are, yes. are lacking of that the any the a specific finding at this moment. So that's what I feel at this. So yeah, so agree. One, and... one more question. One more question is have a radiologist excluded primary or secondary vasculitis? So uh, here she has no history of episodic headaches. Um, migraineous or non-migraineous, there's no history of joint pains, uh, there's no history of any other stroke-like episodes, um, any other, uh, you know, visual loss or oral ulcers or um, arthralgia, joint pain, joint swelling, skin rash. Uh, you could think primary vasculitis, but then uh, why would there be episodes and uh, these episodes would be lasting for a few minutes or a few seconds? If you look electrographically, yes, they last for about two minutes. But if you look at semiology, they, uh, the history as well as what we see in the video EG lasts for hardly 15 seconds and only nocturnal. So that is something odd. Any lesion which is there in the mesial frontal structures, whatever the etiology will be. Now, here the shortcoming here is that we do not um, have, uh, as we go on to the case, we'll uh, see that um, there were certain uh, limitations as to why uh, we needed to do a conservative approach for her. So her video EG was done in the year 2020. And we investigated her for autoimmune workup. We did send her a basic autoimmune workup, which was negative and her thyroids were hypothyroid. So after 2020, when she was told that these episodes are probably coming from the uh, mesial frontal structures and they may need to be, you know, uh, either removed or investigated further, she vanished for two, two years, though the episodes continued. So her video AG was done in 2020. She was so afraid for undergoing any surgery or any kind of further workup uh, that uh, she um, disappeared for two years. And then probably um, she's, uh, she actually went around looking for opinion at other local hospitals and other hospitals in India. And uh, she came back in 2022 to us with worsening of these episodes. And that's when, uh, you know, uh, we did her uh, further investigations. So you can see that. So in the interim, she never had any other, no stroke-like episodes, uh, no uh, prolonged neurological deficits, which one would expect to see in a vasculitis. So again, you see the hypermetabolism, which came in there. So pretty much this area compared to this area. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. So... When she reappeared after two years, we said, okay, let's work up further. And this was the pet. And this is... Because it's useless doing an equal spec. She would never have the event in the morning hours. And she won't sleep in the morning hours. And the event was so brief. There's no way you could do it. So... Manjuri, sorry to bother you. Yeah. Now, um, during the monitoring, did you stop all the medications? 
No, we didn't have to. You didn't stop any medication. No. I just the uh, uh, stopping the medication would give you a different stage of simulation. Yes, she she so, was yeah. she was very resistant to us doing anything. Uh, yes, what I did was I tapered her carbamazepine. As I told you, she was in a very high dose. I believe it was either 600 milligram twice a day or 800 milligrams twice a day. So when we found she's hypothyroid and we were monitoring her, we did reduce her carbamazepine, which uh, she didn't want to increase again because she found she was much more alert and not drowsy. So we sent her on 200 milligram BD after the monitoring. So yes, we did reduce her carbamazepine, but we never stopped her anti seizure medicines. Manjari, could you run these images completely for the sake of viewers? Yeah. And not in between. Yeah. So we can so see. We can see the hypermetabolism there also. The sagittal. Sagittal also showed the same. Yeah, could you show the sagittal also, please? Because this goes for recording, so we need to. So just run it once. So that was the sagittal. Uh, the magnetoencephalography, uh, she didn't have any events, so it was an interictal uh, meg. Uh, it showed us um, multiple, you know, the EG was active as well as the meg signals. And uh, this was kind of parasagittal, not exactly just above the corpus callosum, but a little more uh, dorsolateral frontal. Mm, almost uh, posterior to the lesion. So that was what the MEG was showing. So we had a patient who, have, who was having episodes uh, which were lasting for a few seconds. Uh, electrographically, uh, the uh, semiology wise, the video EG just showed uh, anxiety and restlessness with an aura and um, incontinence. The electrographic events seemed to be longer than uh, what the semiology was or at least where she was indicating that the semiology happened. And the MRI, we were not very sure, but we thought it's a cingulate dysplasia. We were not sure at all. That's why I put the query there. And we found the hypermetabolism in the right cingulate region, though the MEG was a little more posterior. So with all this workup, uh, we contemplated uh, what uh, should we do. And it was pretty challenging because she didn't want any part of her head shaved. She didn't want... Um, any uh, major surgery and she definitely didn't want a prolonged hospitalization. So we were left with um, uh, discharging her and then um, she went around again for a few months and uh, she decided she was still having the episodes and they were still disturbing her sleep uh, and uh, she was unable to function. And she said, is there anything which can stop me getting awake in the night? So uh, with this kind of picture, she came to us. And that's when we discussed in the epilepsy meeting. We probably discussed her about three times in our epilepsy meeting and the challenges uh, which we faced by her demands because she was pretty high functioning. She didn't want uh, a scar on the scalp or any kind of uh, mutilation. So um, we thought of a possibility of recording the events by uh, SEG and... Uh, if we are going to use SEG, uh, if we find there are bursts coming, uh, could we go ahead with uh, removal of it by surgery, which she didn't want? Uh, she was running away all the time and uh, seeking multiple opinions from here and there. Or we could do something which is relatively non-invasive, sparing her a prolonged hospital stay, say discharging her in two to three days from the hospital. So with this in mind, our surgeons uh, had an opinion that, yes, we could implant SCG electrodes, we could record what's happening, and we could then uh, uh, possibly ablate uh, whatever we are seeing 
but the disadvantage of that is we never get to prove what the histology of that lesion was. So, uh, so with this in mind, uh, our mon our meetings, uh, several over several meetings, we came to this decision, which she kind of accepted, and she was quite thrilled with a smile on her face <laughs> that uh, we were not going to uh, crack open her skull. And uh, uh, there were six trajectories uh, which were planned, and uh, I think uh, Dr. Chandra and Dr. Ramesh uh, would be better able to talk about this. So, uh, Dr. Chandra, Dr. Sharad, would you want to uh, discuss this? Yeah. So, uh, so this was done by both me and my colleague, Dr. Ramesh. So we planted around six trajectories, and this shows the Rosa protocol showing the trajectories. So fundamentally, we were very sure that the seizures were coming from this area, as for the information given by the neurologists. So we wanted to put electrodes on the lesion and around the lesions to see, look for the spread of the uh, networks. Can we go to the next slide? And this shows all the trajectories which we had, one inside the lesion. Next. Again, next. Next. This is in front of the lesion, at the back of the lesion. Uh, we didn't think of uh, covering the temporal lobe or more distant regions because we were more or less sure about the hypothesis. Of course, in order to map the entire networks, we could have also covered the basifrontal as well as the temporal uh, to look for the entire extent. Perhaps we could have put one in the anterior insula as well. But there is a cost issue involved because these electrodes are out-of-pocket expenditures for the patient. Fortunately, we are able to give these electrodes free of cost because we do have a research project running, but sometimes they're out of pocket and they do become quite expensive. Next. So uh, pre-ablation, so we did uh, record uh, even in the awake state without her being asleep, uh, recurrent uh, high, free, high amplitude. So here it is, uh, sensitivity is 300 microvolts per centimeter. So very high amplitude bursts. You can see here, uh, they were occurring with areas of attenuation. So burst and attenuation, burst and attenuation. And this went on for quite some time. And you can see again here, here it almost looks like a Caesar happening, a mini Caesar. Of course, it's not filling, fulfilling the 10 second criteria, but these uh, attenuation areas followed by bursts, which were uh, high amplitude were seen. And uh, pretty much we were sure that this is the epileptogenic uh, lesion. And uh, then uh, at the same sitting, uh, we did stimulate her and the stimulation did produce the habitual event with incontinence. Uh, following which uh, we counseled her on the table and uh, this procedure is usually done uh, in, the, in the room itself. So she was in the room and... Uh, awake and uh, the surgeons uh, then decided, counseled her and she was willing for uh, coagulation of uh, the lesion, uh, the, the contacts which were within the lesion. So Dr. So this, this is just to show how, for the viewers, on to show that how the coagulation works when we do it on the egg wire trial. Uh, and it's a very nice coagulation which is produced. Next slide. And we use this using this neon cordon switch. So it is very convenient. So you could record the EEG and you could also then produce coagulation. Uh, so that's very convenient. And we use a Cosman generator to produce this kind of coagulation. Next. And we do it just by the bedside and the patient is completely awake. And it's, it's a very convenient procedure. So the fellow or one of us, we put an auscultation over the head and we hear the sound of pop coming, which indicates that uh, the coagulation has been performed in that area. And it's a very simple procedure. It gets over in about 45 minutes. Patient, except for the fact that the patient feels a pop sensation in the head for which he or she is counseled beforehand. But otherwise, there is no other discomfort here. Next. So for this patient, and, actually, this is not the patient's uh, image. This is a representative patient. Yeah, this is a representative show generally how we do it. And this, this is the post SCG, post ablation SCG recordings. So, and I think that was the last. So all the contacts where there were bursts coming, uh, we kind of uh, lesioned them. And, and this is, so, so as soon as the procedure is over, we remove the, explain the electrodes immediately. And then we shift uh, the patient to a CT scan. Could you show the CT scan again, Manjeet? Yeah. 
So it shows a very nice burnt out lesion over there, exactly in the area where the lesion was. Now, in our experience, we do uh, SCG guided ablation for almost all the cases of our SCG. So we have a trimodal mechanism by which we do our SCGs. We do spontaneous recordings of the SCGs, then we stimulate them to produce habitual seizures in which in this case we have done this. And then we produce an ablation. In this, of course, we produced a large ablation. We put around two electrodes directly into the lesion. And the idea was to provide a therapeutic outcome. But most of the patients, they do have reduction of seizures, which in a kind of adds up to the hypothesis that you're in the right place. And eventually you will have to do an open surgery. But in this patient, uh, till now of six months, I know is not a long period of time. But fortunately, she has been seizure-free till this point of time. And if the seizures do occur, we could always go in and do an open surgery. And I think she may be more willing to do now that she has seen that she has had a good degree of seizure freedom. Or we could again go and ablate the area around it. That also could be an option. But thankfully, till now, she has been seizure free. And the patient is also quite happy till date. So, uh, so we are sure that they were seizures. We have no doubt they were seizures. The only thing we are not very sure is the etiology. Um, as far as possible, the vasculitic workup as well as the autoimmune workup was negative. Um, so we are left thinking that it was probably a dysplasia. However, the patient was not willing for any open procedures. A conservative management was called for. And uh, with that, hopefully she's, she's come for two follow-ups now. Uh, and uh, she has been event free and not been, uh, you know, incontinent, uh, episodic incontinent in, in sleep. So I'd like uh, uh, comments from uh, Dr. Eileen, uh, followed by Zebunasa and Dr. Ekida. And Dr. Kensuke as a and surgeon. Thank you. Yes. Um, so it's really interesting case. Thank you very much. Um, so, well, it's great the patient had a good outcome so far. That's very encouraging. And as you say, um, prognostically, even if she does relapse, then there's a strong argument to proceed to focal resection in that zone. Um, so there were some atypical features in the MRI scan with the multiple lesions and maybe a slightly high signal change um, for dysplasia. On the other hand, the lo localization could be typical for dysplasia. And the PET scan, I thought was in favour of FCD because it was very focal. Um, and again, the age of onset, the nighttime seizures, that could fit with an FCD etiology. But of course, it's always the difficulty with um, the ablation that we don't have the, we don't have the final histopathology. Um, I think, um, I just wanted to ask actually, did you thermocoagulate multiple contacts that were adjacent because it looked like you created quite a large lesion on the CT scan. How many contacts were thermocoagulated? We, so, contacted, we coagulated around six contacts adjacent to okay. each other. So okay. using the switch, using the switch, you could coagulate between two contacts. It's a bipolar kind of a burning between yes. two contacts. Yeah. But yeah. you keep on changing the, so it has an advantage that you could do a pre-recording to see what is the yes. energy and burn it and then again do an EEG recording and if you buy, find some activity you could go and coagulate them again until the EEG becomes you know totally normal yeah that is an advantage you have over this yeah I agree there's an advantage to record the, the EEG um, before during and after thermocoagulation and also um, I think one of you made the point about doing stimulation studies beforehand I think that's very important because for two reasons, you know, one that confirms the seizure onset. So in this lady, that was confirmed, and we know we're in a, a the right zone. But also to make sure we're not in functional cortex, because that could be a contraindication to stimulation. And I'm sure your surgeons also looked at the vascular proximity to make sure that there was no thermocoagulation too close to a, a vessel. That's the other issue for the audience with um, radio frequency ablation. So we always plan the CGs with an MR, contrast MRI. So we are able to look out for the vessels and we, we, we do the planning so that we avoid any major vessels. Yeah, thank you. Can I say? Yes. Yeah, Excellent that's very important. Uh, no, oh, yeah. Go ahead. 
I, I agree with all the comments made by Aileen. Uh, with the lesion, uh, I just wonder, did you have a CT scan uh, for this patient to, you did have pre-op CT scan? Is there yeah, she does have a pre-op CT scan. There was no calcification. No calcification. Okay. Yeah. I just wonder because, because we also thought that the signal was really very bright for the display. Yeah, but well, well, uh, it could be a low grade glioma, even. Um, yeah, otherwise, yeah, I, I don't have anything to comment on this. May I say, uh, Professor Ikeda? Yes, uh, I, I totally agree, and then the, that the patient it was very successful. And the, the uh, actually we have the, uh, the relatively similar patient who have the uh, lesion at the superior frontal sulcus, and then it is, and then the, it never show anything by the scar PG, and then we decided to have a so called strip of the epidural electrodes because the epidural electrodes is not invasive for the, the brain itself, and then we uh, recorded just only two days and three days to see that the as opposed to the scar PG, epidural strip can pick up that the uh, some ictal or the intactal activity, and that was the successful. Then the we now and the go further go to that some the uh, invasive the resection and and so on. So the uh, if the patient in general, if the patient is very much worried worried about that the uh, the direct invasive uh, the SEG, uh, the Japanese patient chosen that the epidural electrode. That is my the experience in the Japanese patients. Thank you. Uh, 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 can I uh, say something? Uh, yes, yes, please, Dr. Ikeda. Uh, okay. Uh, the, uh, from Kawaii, okay. Uh, the, thank you, Sarat. Uh, the, 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 I think the, the, I don't have uh, the. Uh, we just studied uh, SEG robotic SEG, and uh, I don't have uh, uh, experience of uh, the some coagulation yet. But uh, it seems uh, the kind of good, uh, very good alternative when you know the patient has uh, some limitation or the hesitation to you know uh, craniotomy, and I. I uh, uh, but uh, I have uh, uh, two questions. So about the uh, pathology, pathological diagnosis. So uh, uh, it, I think it, it is, it may be possible uh, that you can add, you know, just that, uh, another sterile uh, EEG probe and do the kind of biopsy when you do the thermal coagulation. Is it possible? Uh, this is the first question. Yes. And so we did consider, we did consider doing a biopsy because we do it with, so we thought maybe we could make a sl slightly bigger hole and then do a biopsy. So definitely we are considering this in the future. So mm -hmm. initially, you know, we were hesitant because from such a hole you take out biopsy and, uh, but yes, this is definitely in our mind because our pathologists are not at all happy with this. Uh, and, you know, every time we, pray, you know, present this anywhere, people ask, what is the biopsy? What did you, supposing it's a glioma, it grows, you know, all these issues are there. So definitely we are thinking of doing a biopsy next time through that. So we could take a stereotactic biopsy probe and then take a biopsy before we produce thermocoagulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so, you know, uh, it, it will add just, you know, uh, 30 minutes or so. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the next uh, the next question is about uh, uh, the kind of, uh, the risk of heat injury to anterior cerebral artery. I have no uh, the experience, so I don't know, but uh, uh, the, uh, the lead kind of lesioning of uh, the, uh, the the medial frontal lobe always uh, I I afraid I'm afraid I always carry the risk of you know uh, the anterior cerebral artery heat injury is that uh, is that okay with you? So we discussed this extensively with the people who provided us uh, this coagulation, and the French group has had extensive exp experience with this, especially George Dorf Muller. Mm -hmm. And they have said that the lesioning produced by the SCG electrodes is it's a very specific. They almost compare it to that of a laser lesioning. They say that maximum if you produce at this particular temperature setting, it doesn't go beyond this line. So they have done it in hundreds of patients, and they've been very happy with this because it gives you an uh, or it gives you an option of doing an SCG recording and then producing the lesion in the same setting. It's very convenient. Uh, even if you think of doing a laser, you will have to remove this, then insert a laser thing, and then there is a cost of laser adding up. 
I'm sure it would come in future. But uh, till now, we have been very happy, and the French group has been very, very happy in terms of the accuracy of this kind of lesioning. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there are a couple of questions. The first question is, what are the stimulation parameters from the viewers? So we use the French guidelines. So we use the low frequency and the high frequency for stimulation. The low frequency is one hertz. The high frequency is fifty hertz. For low frequency, we give a shock duration of point five to three milliseconds. For high frequency, give we give to point five to one milliseconds. The intensity again is more or less same for both, which is point five to four milliamps. The duration of stimulation for low frequency is twenty to sixty seconds, whereas for high frequency, it's about three to eight seconds. So we start with low frequency and then we go into high frequency. That's the stimulation parameters, and these have been described well in the uh, French papers. There is one more question which has come up, which says that uh, did you do an MRI? So, uh, so right now we have not done an MRI. The reason is we knew know that on follow up anyway we will have to do an MRI. We are planning to get an MRI done. So immediately post lesioning we have only done a CT scan. The whole idea of doing a CT scan is to look that there is no hematoma or anything, and we have that black lesion which has been produced, and we are quite happy with that. And then so we were planning to do an MRI eventually if she has a recurrence. So, uh, and immediately following the ablation, she's just six months into it. There will be some amount of edema, so we haven't ventured into the MRI. Yes, but if she has a recurrence, we would definitely be doing an MRI. Then there are a number of questions like, did you perform a CG stimulation to make sure that the semiology is same? Yes, we did. Manjiri has mentioned that. So we stimulated, and patient did become incontinent, and that really strengthened the hypothesis. How large area do we cover to make sure that we are done with optimum ablation? So generally, we plan in such a way so that the size of the ablation is at least three to four millimeters larger than that of the lesion. Uh, and by doing ablation, how do you make sure that the histopathology classification of the lesion? And this again, we have discussed. So we are thinking definitely of doing a biopsy next time, so that could overcome it. Uh, but uh, we did it because the patient, you know, was demanded this procedure. You know, she wouldn't have been ready for an open procedure. She was too afraid, and this is the best option we could have given. So I, I believe I covered all the questions. May so, I ask a quick, quick question to uh, Sarah and then Demanjari the and then Eileen? The, when we uh, look at this MRI, uh, that MRI may be. The lesion is actually the bottom of sulcus. So I just wondering that, that this the MRI may be some sort of uh, atypical appearance of bottom bottom of sulcus for cortical dysplasia for a long time period. And uh, that that is my dear quick questions. So this MRI was done at our center. However, she did have two previous MRIs which showed the similar lesion. One was there from around, I think she was around 18 or 19 years uh, or maybe 20 years So the, at the onset, which was not a very good quality one. But if you retrospectively look at that MRI, they, it seemed to be bulky there. The flare wasn't done in that MRI, so we really don't know it was an improperly conducted epilepsy protocol or not even an epilepsy protocol. The second MRI she had about two years back which again showed the same signal and the same uh, bulky, uh, you know, uh, gyrus there. And uh, to me, it looked more than a bottom of sulcus. Uh, it looked, the, the gyri was broadened and uh, different from the corresponding on the left. So it looked like there was a deformity of the gyrus itself, um, even in the previous MRI. Manjuri, there is a question. I think it may be important. Somebody has raised an issue that post RF ablation of a CG showing BS pattern. I don't know what is that. Would you like to comment? A on suppression that? pattern, yeah. yeah. So there okay. is a, in some of the things you see a bird like activity, which is a brief intermittent uh, ictal, but then uh, we did ablate those also. So uh, yes. we did selectively, uh, you know, ablate around six contacts which were within the lesion and maybe a two or three millimeters around it. And uh, yes, there was some burst suppression like activity. Also, during the recording itself, we could uh, see a burst attenuation actually, 
not a suppression because your amplitudes were like our amplitudes were 300 microvolts per uh, this thing. So you really can't comment whether it's an attenuation or a suppression. I would like to call it an attenuation rather than a perception. So, so thank you. I think we have had a lot of questions because of the interesting manner in which uh, we managed the case. And then thank you so much to all the faculty for having actively joined this discussion. So now uh, may I request uh, Professor Eileen McGonigal, McGonigal, I'm so sorry with my pronunciation to start our presentation. Yes, thank you very much, Sarat. Um, so thanks so much, Manjari, for your beautiful presentation. And I hope this next part of the session will be very complimentary. Um, so I will discuss the role of medial structures in frontal lobe epilepsy and describe some observations from SEEG. So as you can see now, I work in Australia, but I spent many, many years working in France with the team in Marseille. So I've been very lucky to have a lot of experience with SEEG in that team. Oops, sorry. Let me just. So this is the structure of the talk. I thought I would first um, give some uh, thoughts about the anatomy of this medial frontal region and think about its relevance for um, frontal lobe epilepsy. Then we will discuss how common is the involvement of these structures in frontal lobe epilepsy. And then lastly, I will um, give some examples of with video of semiologic patterns thinking about this rostrocaudal gradient, the anteroposterior gradients in the frontal lobe. So we know that the frontal lobes are the largest of all the lobes, accounting for up to 40% of cortical volume. And there are significant um, amounts of cortex which is buried. And of course, we also have this very, very complex, oops, sorry, long and short uh, connectivity. Um, which, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, let me just, I'm so, I don't know why my slides are jumping so fast. Um, this complex connectivity gives rise to the rapid and widespread propagation of seizure discharges with rapid evolution of complex clinical signs. Excuse me, let me just, I'm so sorry, let me just check something on my PowerPoint because it's jumping very fast. Let me just check that, I'm so sorry. Uh, Eileen, you could check for slide transition. So if it's an automated Yes, exactly, mode. exactly. I'm just changing that. I'm sorry. Let me just, because otherwise I'll have to speak too quickly. Okay, I think that should be fine now. Let me go back to share again. My apologies, everybody. Okay, so um, I was saying that the frontal lobes are characterized by very complex long range and short uh, both cortical and subcortical connectivity, so connections within the frontal lobe, connections between the frontal and other cortices, and then connections to subcortical structures. And this helps to explain the very rapid and often widespread patterns of propagation that we see in frontal seizures with indeed very rapid evolution of often complex uh, clusters of clinical signs. And so thinking of clinical epilepsy, it's helpful to divide this medial frontal wall into its motor segments, its premotor segments, and then more anteriorly, the prefrontal segments. And we'll mention again this idea of rostral caudal gradient going from the most rostral anterior parts of the frontal lobe back to the most posterior and precentral parts. And you'll see that that's relevant to thinking about semiology and seizure patterns. So within this medial frontal wall, the anterior cingulate gyrus is a very key structure. And we're going to be hearing a lot about that, including in the next talk. So um, briefly, we have these um, key uh, Broadman areas, uh, area 24, area 32, and also area 25, which you know we, we tend to know less about in terms of epilepsy because we less often explore this region. And what's important to remember is that we can think of these two main axes of connectivity. So one is the rostrocaudal. So along the length of the anterior cingulate, we have this connectivity where we can see propagation, but also lateral mesial. So lots of short fibers going from the lateral frontal wall towards the medial frontal wall at each level along this axis. And thinking in terms of um, 
the, the, the surgical anatomy, so Telerax Atlas, indicates that the VCA line, the anterior commissural line, divides the posterior mid-cingulate, which we sometimes call in Broadman's area 24, the posterior part, from the more anterior uh, middle cingulate. And then area 32 is really a separate um, connectivity system. So in a kind of simplified way, we can think about the area 24 regions really um, belonging to the motor system, so having a role in cognition and motor planning, whereas area 32 belongs to the limbic system, and that was mentioned earlier when we discussed the anxiety aura for the previous patient, so um, reflecting a role for emotion and autonomic features. And this will be discussed further in the next uh, talk as well. So we did look at some EG in the previous case, often in fact in these medial frontal cases, the surface EEG can be very difficult, often midline, often involving the vertex electrodes and very often non-lateralizing. This can be a challenge when we're trying to decide is this right or left hemisphere. And I'll just briefly mention this paper by, this is a, a, a quite a historical stereo EEG um, study by the original authors, the original creators of stereo EEG, um, Bonco and Tarahai from Paris. And very interestingly, they were able to perform simulation studies of the medial frontal wall. And they found they could actually trigger seizures, which were like absences by using low frequency stimulation, whereas they could trigger generalized tonic clonic seizures by using high frequency stimulation. And their point was that they really showed these very widespread and bilateral synchronous discharges. And they considered that this was due to the very particular and tight connectivity of this medial frontal lobe. Um, structures with a role for the corpus callosum, which has very short connections with few synapses, so discharges can very rapidly um, express bilaterally. So how common is involvement of the medial frontal structures? So we just discussed quite a lot about focal cortical dysplasia, and in fact this is a, a fairly old paper from over 20 years ago now, um, from a team in Paris who studied the use of SEEG in focal cortical dysplasia. And you can see here that of this series of 28 patients, about one third had frontal lobe localization. And you can see that all of those involved the mesial wall. So this is a, a common occurrence. The FCD commonly involves this medial frontal wall. And if we look at a much bigger series, now this is not an SEG um, series, but it's a, a very, very large multi-center study that collected cases of FCD from around the world. They had over 500 cases in total. And this is very nice because it shows us really the distribution of these, um, these abnormalities. So you can see there's a predominance of frontal pole, of superior frontal sulcus and temporal pole. But when the authors um, broke down the types of FCD, you can see I've, I've outlined here this particular localization of the FCD type 2B, so the classical Taylor's type FCD. And you can see there was a very high representation in the mesial frontal regions. So this is important for us to know as epileptologists because we know that F FCD type 2 often have very good outcome um, surgically if we can localise them and operate them. Um, so, so that's an important thing to keep in mind, that we have a high um, predominance of FCD type 2b in this region. And in this paper, this was mentioned um, earlier, so this is the Bonini et al paper, which I was co-first author on. And I'll come back to the semiology features, but just to think of you know, how common is the role of the medial frontal structures. So in this study, we were able to study over 50 patients with um, frontal lobe epilepsy and SEG. And what we noticed was that there was a very clear tendency for the discharge Whenever it involved the lateral cortex, it would tend to propagate very quickly to the mesial frontal wall. And this was true both for prefrontal organisation, but also uh, premotor, anterior premotor organisation, to the point that we started to think of the medial premotor and cingulate regions as a kind of final common pathway for propagation. So these seizure propagation patterns that we observe in frontal lobe epilepsy reflect these lateral mesial connections, which are organised along this anteroposterior um, axis because the prefrontal um, seizures 
would project to anterior cingulate, whereas the more premotor seizures would project to the motor cingulate and the pre-SMA regions. And just to give you an example of this, this lady has um, anterior prefrontal. You can see on her MRI on the left, she has a, a scar from a previous abscess in her frontal, her orbital frontal cortex. She has complex stereotype movements, repetitive movements of the upper limbs. She's altered awareness. She does not respond to her boyfriend. And just to briefly look at her SEG, you can see on the left of the page a pattern of preectal spiking. This involves orbital frontal and frontal pole um, structures. And then there's this transition in the middle of the page. We see a synchronous spike with a slow wave and then this fast gamma band activity superimposed, which also involves the anterior cingulate. And in fact, the semiology only begins a number of seconds later, about eight seconds after the electrical onset. And you can see here, this is characterized by this slower discharge involving the anterior cingulate. So, you know, the, the, the whole organization of the seizure only expresses clinically once the seizure projects to the anterior cingulate with a slower uh, discharge. And this is also a reminder that this, the semiological output of a seizure depends not only on the initial seizure organization, the seizure onset, but also the early spread network. This is a key concept within SEG work. So for the last part of the talk, I'll just go through some examples of the semiology, and that will hopefully be completed by um, Zeb's talk, which will follow. So we'll think about this Ross recordal gradient. So I'll just go back to this paper, which was mentioned before. So this was a study we did looking at 54 patients who all had frontal lobe epilepsy. They all had SEG. We looked at all of their seizures. So it was quite a detailed and quite a long study where we learned a lot from these. And you can see on this, um, this diagram here, along the horizontal axis at the top, we have listed the brain region. So these go up from the left, the most uh, pre-central um, regions, followed by premotor and then prefrontal. So it goes along an axis from the most posterior part of the frontal lobe towards the most rostral, the most anterior parts here. And then on the vertical axis are the semiological features. So we listed for every seizure and we scored according to their intensity and the earliness of their occurrence, the different semiological features. So from the top of the list, we go from the most elementary motor signs, clonic jerks, versive signs, tonic posture, and so on, down towards um, more kind of primitive um, and non-natural looking uh, complex behaviours, often characterised by proximal movements and tonic signs associated, down gradually towards the most naturalistic and complex behaviours, including emotional signs and social interaction and so on. And we were able to demonstrate this very nice correlation between clusters of brain regions and clusters of signs. And this was very much in keeping with the current neuroscience thinking on the organisation of, of um, cognition and motor control within the frontal lobe. But it was the first time this had ever been shown for epileptic seizures. And then I'll just mention this paper, which came out this year. I think this is a very nice paper by colleagues in Italy. And they looked at a, seizure, a series of 57 patients. So they really wanted to focus more on the cingulate cortex. I think, you know, following on from our work in the whole of the frontal lobe, they were really looking in detail at the anterior cingulates and the posterior cingulates as well. So they had 57 patients. They did not all have stereo EG but many of them did. And the others were um, cured after surgery. So I'll just show you a couple of tables from this paper, but I encourage you to read the paper, which is published in Neurology. Um, so for example, they were able to look at um, the patient's descriptions of their semiology. So actually, interestingly, nearly all the patients had some kind of subjective sign. I think that in itself is quite an interesting observation. And they were able to do some, you can see along the top, these diagrams, they separated out anatomically the anterior cingulate, so this Brodmann's area 32 region that we said was associated with limbic um, structures and the, the limbic connectivity. Then they had another group which was anterior cingulate plus anterior mid cingulate. Then they go back gradually to the more anterior mid cingulate alone. Then the posterior mid cingulate, which is now behind the, 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 the VCA line, as I said. And then in the separate column, they have the posterior cingulate, which is really a completely different structure with different connectivity. So outside of the, the frontal lobe, really a parietal structure. 
um, connected to the, the mesial temporal structures. And you can see here, they were able to demonstrate different patterns of correlation with certain signs showing really good um, correlation in distinguishing between these different localizations along the anterior cingulate. And for example, emotional signs and, and um, autonomic signs were more often associated with anterior localizations, whereas somatocentric features, vestibular signs, um, were associated with more uh, mid-cingulate or, or posterior mid-cingulate localizations. Interestingly, epigastric sensation only occurred with the posterior cingulate localization. And then again from the same paper, these are objective signs, so scored by the doctors looking at the videos. And here they, they really, I think they were, you know, using very much a similar approach to our previous approach in the Bonini et al. paper. And for example, they were showing these detailed correlations along the axis of the cingulate gyrus with emotion, vocalisation, um, the fluidity of the motor behaviour, the repetitiveness or what we called stereotypies in the, the motor behaviour. These were associated with more anterior signs, um, whereas tonic signs, asymmetry um, and patients remaining aware during seizures were associated with more posterior uh, 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 anterior cingulate localisations. And so just to finish, I'll give you some examples of these. So starting with the more um, precentral region, I've just got one example here. So this lady has very, very focal um, epilepsy involving the paracentral lobule and her seizures consist of tonic contraction and sometimes clonic jerks of her toe on the left. So you can see on the SEG, I've selected some um, channels here. On the bottom trace is the EMG. So we see a very nice correlation between the intracerebral signal with um, fast spiking and fast discharge and then a, a, a spike discharge following and the EMG um, uh, signs of the, the, the seizure motor activity. And then going forward in the frontal lobe towards premotor cortex, so this girl um, was actually explored over 20 years ago in France. This is a, a case from a long time ago in Marseille, a girl who had done a, 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 a pattern of motor seizures. You can see here just this screenshot, she had this tonic posture of right arm extension. This is her surface EG, so this reflects what I said earlier, that often with these um, mesial frontal epilepsies, we see a, a vertex pattern on the surface EG. She had this repetitive and almost subcontinuous spiking, um, which now we know can suggest a focal cortical dysplasia pathology. Um, so she underwent a, a, a stereo EG exploration. You can see here I've selected the the SME electrode, which is M prime, this is the left hemisphere, and she has on SEG this continuous spiking of this region. So again, very suggestive of cort cortical dysplasia. Now we recognise this this kind of signature on on SEG, and now she had no spontaneous seizures, but the seizures were triggered by 50 hertz, so um, high frequency stimulation. I'll just show you one seizure. This is stimulating the the M internal contact. So we reproduce the typical uh, right arm extension, head turning, she had some facial contraction as well, some flexion of the left arm. So very habitual seizure triggered by stimulation. You can see Professor Chauvel and Professor Bartolome who are there. And this is just the ACG trace of that, so the artefact of the stimulation, first of all, followed by this discharge in the M prime electrode which is exploring the, the SMA region on the left hemisphere. And she went on to have surgery and became seizure free and the histopathology confirmed a Taylor type focal cortical dysplasia. So I've got a couple of examples more anteriorly again. So this is mid cingulate. This man had seizure onset age 11. He's got quite a complex motor semiology. You'll see he has some right hand dystonia, some facial contraction grimacing. So I'll just show you his seizure. You can see the facial contraction, frowning, it goes a bit red. He's got some um, upper body tonic contraction as well, quite bilateral, but more marked right hand dystonia. So some lateralizing features here, this kind of breathing change and also some more axial body changes. Now, I don't have his MRI to show you, but he had a uh, suspected um, FCD, he had a lesion in his, his mid cingulate region, so he went on to have surgery directly without ACG and he became seizure free. This was an FCD type 2. And then I have another case which is 
Again, mid cingulate, probably slightly more anterior than the previous patient. This is a case from the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne. So I'm very grateful to Professor Terence O'Brien and Dr. Andrew Neil, who kindly agreed to, to share this case with me. So I'll just show you this man's video. He's speaking to Professor O'Brien and starts to have, you can see much more complex motor signs, quite high amplitude movements of his legs, raises both arms above his head and had a facial change um, and then very quickly recovered and could continue the conversation. So he was suspected to have a, um, a focal lesion on MRI. It was quite subtle, but on PET scan, there seemed to be a clear, you can see quite nicely on the coronal sign, um, images here, a very focal looking hypometabolism, which would be very suggestive of FCD. He underwent steroid EG in Melbourne and then um, was able to undergo a uh, resection following that, which confirmed the, the localization and he's become seizure free. And then I'll just finish by showing you some um, more anterior cingulate cases. So um, the first lady on the left, now I must warn you because she's got quite a loud vocalisation, she's got the screaming, but I decided to leave it in the video because I think it's important. And this was one of the features that the Italian paper I just mentioned on cingulate semiology, they really highlighted a very emotional character to vocalisation in the most anterior portion of the cingulate. So let me just show you this lady's case. So you can see extremely hyperkinetic behaviour. She has a facial change, she's got a very slight mouth contraction and then a fearful facial expression. It's as if she's trying to escape or fight with the nurses. Actually, she also has urination, which is like the first case that Dr. Manjari showed us. Um, now, this lady was an MRI negative case. She had an ECG, which showed very clear anterior cingulate involvement, but also orbital frontal cortex and um, amygdala. So this is to highlight that, you know, we're really talking about networks here. There can be cases where we have an isolated cingulate organization that can occur. But my experience is that more commonly, um, in the cases who have undergone kind of traditional stereo EG exploration in France from our, our, our experience from those cases shows that we tend to have this cluster of, of um, connected structures which are involved in seizures and very, very commonly in this group involving the anterior cingulate area 32, we have some temporal lobe involvement as well, especially when we have emotional signs during the seizure. Now this lady went on to, to have surgery to the orbital frontal cortex and the anterior cingulate and she's become seizure free. She had a, a Taylor type um, uh, dysplasia and interestingly she had some interictal behavioural, uh, psych psychiatric type behaviour with compulsive behaviours, with addiction and those all settled down after surgery so we suspect that she had some interictal uh, prefrontal network dysfunction which was driving her psychiatric presentation as well. I'll just give another example. Oh, sorry, not that one. Let me just show you the next man. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, hang on. Let me just go to this one here. Is that playing? Okay, I'll show you this one first. So this boy has not yet had stereo EG. He's, on. He's, he's a patient from Brisbane. So we're, you can see he turns onto the prone position and has these very fast hyperkinetic movements of the axial portion, very fast pelvic movements, and he tends to swear during his seizures. So I suspect that he has anterior cingulate involvement in his seizures. He's previously had a right lateral frontal resection which did nothing to help his seizures. So I'm hoping to do his CWG quite soon once we finish the surgical workup. How are you feeling? Okay, let me just see if I can show this one. Sorry, I'm just having trouble playing this one. This man, he also turns to the prone position, has some very hyperkinetic movements, and he describes a feeling of fear and anxiety which was very marked at the onset of his seizure. So again, this anterior limbic system organisation. So just to finish there, so the medial frontal region, region we can think about it being characterised by the rostral caudal 
and the lateral medial connections that really help to drive, to shape these semiological patterns that we can observe. And our observations using stereo EG in a large series of frontal lobe seizures indicate that the anterior cingulate and the medial premotor regions seem to be a sort of final common pathway for seizure propagation according to the different uh, segments of the rostrocaudal part of the, the, the frontal lobe. Focal cortical displays it as a very common pathology in this region. We should always be thinking about that in these cases. And from stereo EG, we now have quite a lot of evidence of this rostrocaudal gradient of semiologic clusters across the whole frontal lobe. That was from our paper from Marseille. And also um, from this year, this anterior cingulate paper as studied by um, colleagues in Italy. Of course, there's many other publications on um, frontal lobe seizures, and for the sake of time, I couldn't cover them all. But I think these two large series are really very informative for us. So I'll finish there. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor McGonigal. That was a wonderful presentation. And it was very nice seeing your papers, which you have published. Uh, so, uh, are there any comments from uh, Professor uh, Kensuki, Professor Ikeda, Manjari? May I say? Yes, yes, Professor. Can you hear me? Yeah. The brief, uh, the quick question. Aline, excellent uh, the lecture. I really appreciate. And then the one quick question is: How often did you uh, encounter the patient who had the urinary incontinence as like a, a present patient? Yes, it's a good question. I was just thinking about that when Dr. Manjari presented her case. So the, the lady with the screaming, she definitely had constant, I mean, it was every single seizure she had incontinence. Otherwise, I think it was rare. I don't recall other patients who consistently had that as part of their semiology. Sometimes patients would report that um, and, you know, historically during nighttime seizures, but sometimes in those cases we weren't sure if they had perhaps had secondary generalisation. You know, of course, that's the commonest um, circumstance in which we patients report urinary incontinence. So in my experience, it's not a very common feature, um, but it was certainly interesting to see that in the first case. Thank you. Uh, uh, can I make one question? Uh, this is quite okay. Uh, the, I'm impressed. Uh, yeah, the, the uh, kind of uh, uh, know, theory and uh, the proof of uh, the lateral to medial and uh, the anterior uh, rostral to caudal propagation pattern, and that uh, that is in, in the case of uh, the uh, the uh, kind of uh, the localized lesion case or. Uh, non uh, MRI negative cases is also uh, you can uh, 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 adopt that theory to uh, uh, non uh, non visual cases. Yes, very much so because I think um, actually a number of those cases I described were MRI negative cases. We mm. previously did some work in Marseille when I worked there um, to show that we had similar uh, yield of localization and surgical resection and good outcome in MRI negative versus lesional cases. Um, I think that the um, conceptual basis of SEG, of course, developed before MRI existed because it is a method from the 1960s onwards, so in the pre-modern um, imaging era. So I think the key there is a, a good kind of understanding of semiology and a good understanding of brain connectivity in order to determine the exploration strategy and then to really understand the how the different structures interact for the epileptogenic zone. Mm -hmm. So in that frontal lobe series, I think there were about probably 60% were lesional cases and about 40% non-lesional, something like that. I see, I see. So because yeah. uh, I believed uh, in non-legional cases, you know, the kind of the network is a kind of, you know, the diffuse and uh, uh, not, you know, one direction, but, uh, you know, uh, the very multiple direction. So if uh, so, uh, your theory applies, then you, uh, there, uh, uh, the, you know, another kind of uh, the surgery would be suggested for this connection of those you yes. know, propagation uh, routes. I, yeah. I think it's a really good comment about MRI negative cases because 
I think that um, when we're thinking about MRI negative cases with stereo EG, we must be thinking of the possible localization, but we must also be thinking of the possible etiology. Because in our experience in France, um, I'm talking about France because I've only just come to Australia, so my most of my experience has been in France. Um, the patients who had very good outcome after surgery and you know, in whom we could confidently localise the epileptogenic zone, they were usually patients who had MRI negative focal cortical dysplasia. We know that quite a number of these FCD may not have a radiological signal. Um, of course, that depends on the resolution of MRI scan and the expertise in each centre. But, you know, even with good three Tesla scans, often there can be FCD, which are essentially invisible. Perhaps we have a clue from the PET scan or... So the, the MRI negative cases can have a focal organisation if the underlying etiology is focal. But you're quite right. Some of them have widespread, diffuse organisation, in which case they may not be good candidates for focal resection. And perhaps we have to look at other, other approaches. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. There are a couple of questions from the audience. So uh, one question is that Felicia et al. reported successful surgery patients. What about the failure surgery patients? Did they have a similar semiology? Well, that's a good question. Um, I don't believe that we saw differences in semiology according to seizure freedom and not seizure freedom. Um, on the other hand, I think that it's a really good question because, for example, if we have some kind of semiology that's very non-specific, you know, say we have maybe some hyperkinetic pattern or some tonic posture, but no other localizing signs, if we have normal MRI, nor we have non-localizing PET and non-localizing MEG and surface EG, probably there are no clear hypotheses to proceed to stereo EG. I think SEG should only be done if we have some kind of clear information um, from semiology plus other supporting data. So um, I guess what I have seen poorer outcomes surgically is when the semiology is not very clear and therefore we don't have a good SEG implantation strategy because we don't really know. In those cases, we should not do a fishing expedition. We should say, well, we don't have a good argument to proceed to, to SEG. That's, that's my opinion. Uh, one more question from, again, Dr. Swami from India. Is BA4624, are the only motor boundaries? Um, so when you say motor boundaries, I'm not quite sure what you mean. Um, certainly that would be the main motor system. Um, but of course, we're to just talking in this um, in the seminar about the medial frontal lobe. So we're focusing on that in terms of the anatomy. Um, we have 24 is the, the, the medial part of the, the the motor cingulate, but there would also be, of course, other considerations with regards to the lateral part of the cortex. Thank you. Uh, there are actually quite a number of questions, so let me read out. Uh, so there is one question from Nigeria. So he says, can a patient with epileptic psychosis be benefited from surgery? Mm. I think the only indication for surgery is to treat seizures, which are non-responsive to adequate trials of uh, medication. So patients with focal and pharmacoresistant epilepsy, it's the only indication for surgery. Um, sometimes there might be some additional benefit to the patient's psychological state or psychiatric problems with surgery, but we would never perform surgery in order to treat the psychiatric condition. Interestingly, you know, for psychiatric conditions, we do a single automies. So, okay, so I see. It's, it's I very see. close to the area where you have such episodes. Uh, yes. In fact, center, we have done single automy for about three or four patients with obsessive compulsive disorders. And, oh, I see. Okay. Uh, and they have, I mean, using the same robotic system and putting an SCG and then burning them out. And they have done pretty okay. well. Psychiatrists have been quite happy so far. Uh, one more question from Indonesia. 
Do you have any recommendation drug of choice for frontal lobe epilepsy with negative MRI if surgery cannot be done? Um, yeah, it's a tricky. Oh, sorry, please, please. Yeah, so uh, the autosomal dominant nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy, which is uh, you know the nicotinic uh, stalconic nic nicotinic uh, receptor, or uh, oxcarbamazepine, the sodium channel blockers, carbamazepine, oxcarbamazepine, and sometimes even uh, nicotine. Uh, has been used uh, to treat. Uh, uh, I have come across few reports where they used memantine for. Um, there were uh, there was a large family where memantine was used. So um, I think the sodium channel blockers are the ones which uh, have uh, been thought to have a little more success than the others. Thank you. So uh, there's a the last. Eileen, Eileen wanted to uh, say something. Yeah. No, please. That, that, that was a very good answer, Manjali. Thank you. Uh, finally, the last question. Is there any SCG studies to know the network pattern of parasomnias? Um, so the people who have worked on this more, most are the team in um, Milan. Um, Professor Nobili is very interested in parasomnias and also um, Professor Tassinari from Italy. Um, so there are some studies, but of course, we don't do SCG as an indication um, in parasomnia. It's only for intractable epilepsy. So there's limited, there's limited knowledge. But some of the patients with frontal lobe seizures also have parasomnia. So we have some clues um, from that, but there's actually a very limited number of patients. And of course, many of these automatic motor patterns are probably reflecting subcortical uh, systems that are released. So we don't, uh, you know, routinely explore the subcortical systems. We don't quite understand yet all the networks involved, but there certainly are some overlaps between the clinical picture of parasomnias and frontal seizures. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful lecture. I think we had a very interactive discussion. So I will now request uh, Dr. Zibunissa Rahman to start her presentation. Thank you so much. Um... That was an excellent talk uh, by um, Aileen and Manjuri as well. Uh, so I'll just um, quickly talk about this um, uh, singlet cortex, cortex stimulation and connectivity in relation to the seizure semiology though. Um, as um, Aileen mentioned that the singlet cortex epilepsy is often uh, very difficult uh, given its uh, connectivity with the various part of the brain uh, is not quite straightforward to diagnose clinically. And, and uh, typically this, uh, in the literature, uh, when there is a lesion in this region or depth electrode uh, proof the seizure onset is from that region has been described. Um, otherwise, uh, seizure semiology itself is um, tricky, um, as you can see uh, from Manjuri's case as well. So in this talk, um, I'll talk a little bit about the anatomical functional connectivity of singlet cortex. Uh, I'll highlight the specialized motor function of the mid singlet cortex, uh, some direct uh, electrical cortical stimulation, our own experience, and a little bit of singlet epilepsy in the end as well, uh, connecting with the connectivity of the singlet cortex. Uh, so singlet gyrosome, it was described for the, uh, first in 1838 um, and was thought to be a single functional entity. Uh, over the years with the advance in the neuroimaging, as well as the um, cytology and connectivity study, um, the evolution occurred, but it took about uh, one and three fourths of a century um, to uh, recognize that the singlet cortex is much more of a complex structure. And, and Brockett et al. in 2004, they have described there are full region, um, uh, anterior singlet cortex, mid singlet cortex, posterior singlet cortex, and retrosplenial cortex. And retrosplenial cortex is buried within the colossal sulcus. And each of this region is um, subdivided into eight subregions. The singlet cortex is bounded by the singlet sulcus um, above. And you can see the singlet sulcus itself is very complex. And one third of the singlet cortex is actually buried within the sulcus. Uh, it could be just a single sulcus, it could be a segmented single sulcus, it could be double sulcus or double sulcus with uh, segmentation. 
So the anatomical function and connectivity has been um, described um, uh, both in the uh, primary study as well as a human study. I'll, I have brought some of the primary study because it gives some of the, more of a visual impression of the connectivity. So in primary, both the uh, microstimulation study as well as the um, connectivity study uh, by the horseradish peroxidase injection showed a significant connectivity of this region. The subgenual anterior SCC, you can see it has got an intimate connectivity with the orbital frontal cortex and frontal polar region, and so does the pregenual anterior cingulate cortex. In addition, this uh, region has a connectivity with the mid-cingulate cortex as well. Uh, in human, um, the functional neuroimaging study has proven that uh, there it is responsible for automatic regulation of emotion. And the microstimulation study has shown that, I'll just remove this so that you can see, uh, the, the electrical stimulation study has proven that this region is responsible for autonomic function as discussed in uh, Manjuri's case. The mid cingulate cortex is, is very unique because of the presence of the motor cortex in this region. This is a primate brain. Um, and you can see this uh, singular sulcus is open. This is the ventral bank. This is the dorsal bank. And you can see there are three distinct uh, motor region in this um, area. The rostral cingulate motor area, which is just anterior to the vertical SL line, which is also known as M3. And the dorsal cingulate motor area, ventral and dorsal, they're located along the ventral and the dorsal bank of the singular sulcus, just below the SMA. And this is known as M4. And when you look at this connectivity study, um, again, this, all these motor areas are very well connected. So M3, M4, with the M2, which is the, uh, the mesial um, SMA uh, or mesial temporal structure, and then M1 is the primary motor cortex. They are very intimately connected. Again, you saw this, all these have a very tight connections, and it's not surprising why the semiology from this region is, uh, is very complex. Now, when you talk about the um, human study, the, there is an electrical stimulation study, which has proven that there is similar motor cortex in this region. Uh, back in 1951 by Penfield and Welsh, then Talara, and most re recent study by Foster Caruana from Italy has uh, shown that the missing lead cortex is responsible for various motor function. It includes the getting up impulse, reaching and grasping, body directed actions, and exploratory gazing. And it's not surprising that autopsy study actually showed the pyramidal cells in this region in human. And um, these cells, uh, unlike the primary cortex, uh, motor cortex pyramidal cells, they're immature cells. And it's not surprising why they don't have a, a very formed um, and, or, or voluntary movement from this region. Functional PET study also supported that uh, there is a motor region in this um, uh, uh, area of the brain. Uh, finally, the functional neuroimaging study by Selin Amis has shown that there are distinct um, three singlet motor region, um, uh, which is a corresponding to the, uh, uh, the macaque uh, monkey. And moreover, what they have shown that there is a somatotopic distribution of the motor cortex, so the tongue is more anterior and limb is more posterior. Uh, we have done a uh, prospective study of uh, uh, electrical stimulation. We mainly had an interest for the mid cingulate cortex, and we have found that um, in, uh, a nine of our patients did have a motor response from the mid cingulate cortex, uh, grasping and groping we have produced from the uh, mid cingulate cortex just around the anterior uh, vertical SC line and anterior to that you have produced some automatis, oral automatisms in one patient and tonic posturing in three patients just posterior to the region where we produce the grasping. And this is some of the example I'm just uh, starting all this too. So what we have done that uh, in, in two patients, there is spontaneous grasping. And in three patients, after sensory stimulation, actually a patient did have a grasping. Uh, we also have uh, examined the patient by opening and closing the eye. 
uh, to um, see whether the visual stimulus has got an additional effect on grasping. Uh, this patient had a spontaneous grasping when the visual uh, stimulation was taken um, as, as well. And the grasping is typically produced from the depth of the single sulcus, just you can see, just over or anterior to the vertical SC line, except this case where it was just posterior to the vertical SC line. But this patient actually um, had a trophy of the brain, and we thought that perhaps uh, the, the cingulate motor area producing the grasping is, is located. It's a similar region in all the patient, perhaps just anterior to the vertical SC line. Uh, all of these patients had a PET scan, uh, which showed a normal, uh, you know, the, uh, the PET uh, uh, metabolism in this region as well. And none of these patients had any seizure arising from this area at all. Uh, this is another patient with the uh, single stimulation producing some motor movement of the mouth. And we told the patient to stick the tongue out. And on stimulation, uh, she couldn't just keep it out. So there is definitely some motor function in this region. And then you can see this location of this uh, just at the depth of the sulcus. It can support that uh, there is a motor, um, separate motor products in this region. Now, going to the posterior singlet uh, network, uh, this is again the primary study. This is very unique um, and, and fascinating that um, a posterior singlet products has an intimate connectivity with the dorsolateral um, frontal lobe, primary motor products, and frontal eye field. Um, and I'll show you an example how how fascinating when you see this burst effect in a patient uh, coming uh, from the uh, posture singlet products. And the human study, when you talk about the, uh, there is a, um, a DTI tractography, and you can see uh, there is a connectivity of this dorsal uh, piece, the PCC, with the ventromedial uh, prefrontal cortex. And as Aileen already mentioned, that the um, uh, ventral PCC and retrosplenial cortex has a connectivity with the mesial temporal lobe. So it's not surprising that seizure from this region actually causes some limbic feature. So just um, in our, as, as I told, the single epilepsy is very uncommon. Um, and it's not surprising that single products is so mesial. Um, the proofing the uh, seizure is coming from this region is very difficult without a depth electrode. In our center, we have got a pure single epilepsy we have found in five patients. Um, uh, and uh, some of uh, the other patients may have some, uh, you know, the singlet plus epilepsy, which singlet plus about 10 patients, and posture singlet plus epilepsy in, in another six patients. This is the summary of our cases. As you can see, the four of these patients uh, has had lesion. Only one patient was non-lesional, who did have seizure arising from the mid-singlet products, and patient underwent a stereoEG. Um, and, and, and we prove that the seizure of, uh, on its zone is actually the missing leg products. I'll go to, through some of these cases to connect with the network. Uh, so this is a 20 year old uh, patient with a fearful aura. You can see this uh, very um, screaming sound, hypermotor seizure. And at times the patient also complain of the penile erection. And you can see a subtle lesion there um, in the anterior singlet cortex. And this uh, is not surprising that all this connectivity, the frontal polar and orbitofrontal region, uh, the seizure spread quickly to that network causing hypermotor seizure. And this patient has a focal cortical dysplasia type two. And you can see this, um, uh, the fearful um, facial expression. And you can also, also see this, um, uh, the labial fold is um, uh, not quite sharp with the gendrome, but this facial expression is very distinct. And uh, this is a 29 year old female, uh, again, 
very fearful aura that was the typical uh, complaint from the patient. And with this complex motor movement, it's not quite hyperkinetic, but both uh, proximal and distal movement, you can see the facial expression is very distinct. Sorry that I can't hear the um, sound here, but she did have a screaming as well. And uh, the series has proved that the seizure on Sazon is in the missing leg products. Again, the connectivity supports all this um, uh, beautiful network. This is another patient with a 27 year old male uh, uh, with the look at this seizure, it's very fascinating. The right bursive head turn with some body turn, rapidly progressing to a field hypokinetic movement and a secondary generalization. So this patient has a lesion in the posture singular products and the histopathology has proven it's an oligastrocytoma WHO grade two. Uh, so this, this uh, connect, understanding this connection is important. Um, and uh, it's, if we see just the seizure without connecting to other aspects, or if there is no lesion, it would be really difficult to localize this seizure in the uh, posture singular region. So I'll just um, quickly go through some of the literature um, uh, with the uh, singlet. Um, I have removed some of the um, literature, which is already discussed by Alien. Uh, the so, anti singlet epilepsy typically described by Banford and Talarek in 1992. And uh, this is the typical description that intense fright, screaming, aggressive verbalization, co complex gestural automatisms, and subsequently, um, there are other case series. Um, uh, the Leahy in 2011 has discovered 19 patients uh, with anterior seizures, and 16 of these patients had a MRI lesion. And again, they have discussed about this vocalization, hypermotor seizure, and tonic posturing. But the typical or commonality of these seizures, I would say that um, the vocalization, screaming, and interfere. Uh, followed by a hyperkinetic movement. Uh, but there are some atypical features, uh, uh, including the myoclonic jerk um, uh, and a clonic seizure as well in this region, but these are very uncommon. The further study by um, al in 2013 has described a typical or banquet type seizure in six uh, patients and atypical group uh, four, and they have also described that simple motor seizure can occur uh, from this region. Uh, so that, that makes it very complex to diagnose uh, interesting related epilepsy without a lesion, uh, very challenging. Uh, for the st study by um, uh, Suritri et al. in 2014 also uh, described the ictal pouting. Um, the patient I showed there from anti-singlet um, seizure, there's some, it's not quite chapeau, but there is some uh, uh, at least unilateral parting, I would say, yeah. and they have shown that the eight out of the nine patients had a ictal parting from this region. The mixing electronic epilepsy, um, again, uh, this is a case by Brazil. Uh, it's a beautiful paper uh, where the patient had an alien hand syndrome during the seizure, like it grasping, uh, and uh, this patient had a lesion in the uh, singular sulcus. Uh, there are further uh, studies by Paul et al. in 2018. Uh, they have shown, you know, they described two seizures from a single region, and both of them had lesions. So when there is a lesion, it's very easy to connect this uh, with the semiology, but otherwise, this lightheadedness, uh, dysphagia, uh, tonic posturing, um, uh, and, and this, you know, the uh, chronology of symptoms would be very confusing. So posture singlet uh, cardiac seizure, again, uh, three cases were described by Alehi in 2011. Um, uh, and uh, they described the bilateral tonic posturing, contralateral arm posturing. Um, and we know that there is some connectivity with the mesial, um, uh, the frontal structure uh, that is responsible for that. Uh, again, uh, in Atsu et al. in 2013, described seven patients uh, an automotive seizure 
uh, dialectic seizure, bilateral tonic seizure, and hypermotor seizure. So there's a variety of seizure related to this posture singular cortex epilepsy um, uh, is described in the literature. Uh, Al-Gaudry again described four patients, um, or uh, 100% of their four patients is a deja vu jumai who depersonalization, abdominal and gastrointestinal aura is very much of limbic uh, type of symptoms. Uh, not surprising given its connectivity with the mesial temporal structure. 75% um, patient had a, a motor seizure, so of course out of four is only three patients. It could be simple motor seizure, it could be automotor seizure, a uh, patient could have a dialectic seizure, and, and all of this patient actually progressed to a bilateral tonic tonic seizure. So singlet epilepsy is very difficult to tie together. Um, electrical stimulation study is important uh, because this gives us some insight into the uh, semiology or functionality of the brain, which you can connect with the seizure semiology. So in entry singlet cortex, um, it, it is a limbic network. Uh, it has the connections with the autonomic nucleus and it's responsible for anxiety, fear, and autonomic dysfunction, as we have seen some cases today. Uh, it has an extensive connectivity with the orbitofrontal and frontopolar region, and the lateral and mesial prefrontal structure, and that's why it can cause hypermotor seizure. Uh, but the PO autonomic and the limbic uh, seizure is a, is a good example uh, given by Manjuri today. So it's just um, it's, it's the first case I've ever seen. Uh, the mixing lead cortex um, is, is a motor area. You need to remember they have got a motor cortex buried within the singlet sulcus, and uh, they can produce complex motor movement, um, uh, groping and grasping. Uh, also, because it is connected with the M1 and the M2, it can cause some tonic posturing. Uh, posture single lead cortex has connected with the mesial temporal structure and can cause abdominal aura deja vu and automatisms. Um, it is highly metabolic uh, area, it's responsible for arousal, so it can cause behavioral arrest or dialectic type of seizure or focal unaware seizure. Uh, it has a connectivity with the prefrontal cortex, so versive seizure and hypermotor seizure can occur as well, just to remember. Uh, just to summarize, um, the clinical ability to precisely localize seizure arising from single cortex is very limited because of its extensive connectivity and diverse semiology. In many cases, uh, discharges arising from the small cortical areas in single cortex do not produce any subjective or objective symptom. Symptoms occur when the discharge is spread to the specific region that is remote in time and anatomy. Our sinus symptoms are due to involvement of the network, um, as I have shown that it has an extensive network. Uh, I'll just stop there. Thank you so much. I would like to acknowledge um, our epilepsy unit, Dr. Chong Wang and um, Professor Andrew Blissell, and our epilepsy nurse as well, and our neurosurgeons, Dr. Mark Dexter and Jim Olson. Thank you. Thank you, Zeb. That was a wonderful presentation and a very nice and wonderful addition to what Eileen has already spoken about. I, I think both of you have covered every aspect of. Uh, singlet gyrus and that would be very very useful for our reviewers so uh, are there any comments by uh, kensuke by dr rikeda so there is some uh, question uh, yes, there is a question yeah. uh, the question is uh, the grasping behavior is it mcc or premotor and which triggers the other uh, the grasping is purely from the uh, missing lead cortex. And we found that in our stimulation studies, a specific region is in the depth of the sulcus. Um, and it's very interesting in five patients, they all are in the uh, just anterior to the vertical AC line, as I showed that uh, particular slide. Only one patient is just posterior to the vertical AC line, but that is, we thought, because this patient has an abnormal MRI, patient has got a trophy, but the region is very specific in the mid single leg cortex, but it's a posterior mid single leg cortex in our study, not the anterior. Mm -hmm. Any, yes. any other? Yeah, could you hear me? Yes, yes, Dr. Ikeda, please go ahead. Yeah. 
Uh, thank you very much for uh, the very uh, important uh, the lecture. Uh, my question may be a little bit aside from that the function of the major frontal, but I really would like to ask you because you have the many ex uh, the experiences. And once you make the stimulation of this the uh, area where that the really the epileptogenic activity is uh, present, uh, we quite often encounter the after discharge, and then we could not no, no longer continue. But the, once we repeat that the stimulation with the same intensity, sometimes that we could uh, observe that the after discharge did not appear, and then we gradually increase that the stimulation intensity. So I'm very curious why it's happened. Uh, it is simply say that the, some the intrinsic inhibitory mechanism was induced. But the, I, I just the personally feeling that the, the repeated stimulation can really the, the, uh, generate so-called the cortical spreading depression, which could uh, suppress that the, some sort of excitability of the brain. So that may be happening while we are now stimulating that the seizure onset zone. So if it is so, we may the, uh, encounter that the, uh, once we increase that the stimulation, the background activity of the brain, EG, EcoG, may be getting smaller. So I just would like to ask you some feeling and then some experience for that possibility. Now with the after discharges in the EEG, uh, uh, when we just stimulate, I, I stop that, but when you see that, when you increase the stimulation current, you may not see the after discharges because of the suppression. So my experience is that I actually increase the current. Okay, so I stop there when I see the after discharge. However, I still increase the current to see whether the after discharge reappear and often you see that it doesn't occur with the higher stimulation. Ellen may correct me if you have a different experience, and, and we can continue to increase stimulation in that way. I think that's the, I don't know whether I have correctly understood what your exact query is, um, the, but, but after discharges itself, I think indicate a hyperpolarization. After when we have, there is after discharge, when you stimulate again, there is a hyperpolarization and you may not stimulate any seizure from the same region it produces a after discharge. That's my understanding. Did I did I correctly understand your question? Is that the question? No, uh, the okay. So the, I really would like to know that the, you actually have the, exactly the same experience for us. But namely, once we have the after discharge, we mm -hmm. could stimulate or we could wait and then we could stimulate the same intensity the after discharge may disappear and then we could gradually again start increasing mm -hmm. that intensity that's what i would like to ask it is correct yeah i, I do that okay. i normally okay. increase okay. it uh, and, and you often you much. don't see that um, at all yeah. so that's that's that that's prompt uh, that reminds me uh, the possibility of the cortical spreading depression which we yeah. uh, actually the uh, elicited that is my the hypothesis thank you very much yeah yeah exactly uh, but uh, the physiological mechanism, perhaps a hyperpolarization. Um, yeah, the, uh, yeah. Uh, as a matter of fact, the, the cortical spreading depression used to be uh, understood as the uh, hyperpolarization, but it it was actually preceded by that the cortical spreading depolarization initially. So it mm -hmm. makes sense that the the uh, presence of after discharge happened, then the it's now the getting calm. So it makes sense. That's what I feel at this moment. Thank you very much. There is a question from Canada. What are the functional deficits expected following cingulate resections? Uh, no functional deficit should occur in, in our experience. A very limited case you have done. Eileen, any uh, more experience? There can be uh, sometimes uh, because the uh, mesial frontal uh, cingulate, uh, particularly the anterior ablations uh, or uh, destructive lesions like stroke or uh, you know, tumors in that region can cause uh, a kinesia and cause abulia. 
it can cause mood yes. changes uh, it can cause ocd at times and mood changes particularly depression so destructive lesions are known to affect uh, um, these uh, functions and i think uh, there is some literature on uh, uh, producing some change in uh, the you know metacognitive uh, process thinking about thinking and those kind of things so um, yes uh, they could be deficits which produce particularly in large lesions and large yeah i would agree i think um, i've seen a patient with a kind of apathy and echinacea type picture which was transient it's kind of resolved within two to three days post op but he had quite a large resection including motor cingulate um but there was no there was no actual um motor deficit there was no hemiparesis or anything so yes patients usually seem to to tolerate um resections in this region quite well i don't know if any of the neurosurgeons have a comment on that um nothing more than what manjari has already commented uh, but generally echinacea abelia they occur usually with very large strokes uh, not yeah. with focal yeah. lesions and uh, you know even if uh, it uh, looks like uh, the unilateral lesion uh, large lesion uh, uh, even uh, often after surgery that uh, involves you know temporarily the kind of bilateral uh, the cingulate and the, in that case you know the the patient uh, 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 have a tendency to show uh, the symptoms i, I guess uh, there is one more question from india does hyper synchronization of sma and motor cc on a cg needs removal of both does the question make sense yes uh, but the sma and which is or hyper synchronization that's what uh, uh, it says hyper synchronization of both sma and motor cc uh, sing, uh on sc does it remo need removal of both of them yes uh, when you talk about the resection uh we always talk about the what is a seizure onset zone and and surrounding our early spread zone and the seizure freedom is always better if we just can remove both the seizure onset and early spread zone and it's not uncommon for us to see that you know within you know the 50 millisecond or 100 millisecond seizure spreading from the epileptic seizure onset zone to the surrounding area and if that is the case i think that should be removed now ailin you must have uh, more experience than me yeah i think it's a good question because we don't truly really have good evidence of how much do we need to remove to make the patient seizure free that's still a very open question um and you know where does the role of semiology fit into that um but i agree i think if the the spread is is clearly involving especially these very tightly connected regions often we have to 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 consider a, a slightly larger resection um but it's it's a very difficult question it's uh then we have a final question from indonesia Uh, he says that i have a patient with meningitis she presented with some kind of asymmetric generalized shaking movement if i touch any part of the body so could it be a seizure it's a good question but we need to know a little bit more though uh now meningitis um if it is associated with encephalitis uh, that can cause uh, epilepsy even meningitis is is is, is described in literature causing seizure as well as status and now the the stimulus sensitive seizure we have seen in the central epilepsy and uh, the patient who does have a um, motor seizure for a uh, different etiology uh, they they are often you know the stimulus mm -hmm. any single movement or touching can cause a motor movement uh, but that should be a um localized or lateralized rather rather than seizure arising from everywhere so uh i don't have experience of 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 this at all uh, but i have patients with a, a typical rasmussen encephalitis and others 
who does have a motor seizure and, and uh, they are very stimulus sensitive. So, so we come May to the I end say, of. Could you yes, Dr. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. That's a, a that's a very important question. I certainly understand that the patient underwent the meningitis or encephalitis. Mm -hmm. It can have some sort of uh, a functional impairment, more or less the uh, wider area. The ones they have the wider area of the uh, impairment, the patient actually tried to uh, they have uh, so called the stimulus sensitive seizure. So it can be not elicited by that the touch, but also some sounds or the photic stimulation. So therefore, it could be better to check that the, this seizure can be elicited by the other modalities. So if it is so, it is a much more likely caused by that the uh, uh, the larger impairment of the brain caused by the inflammation. Mm -hmm. That is my the, uh, experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have come to the end of this webinar. I think overall it's been a wonderful learning lesson. lesson and we have gone through all aspects of uh, medial uh, frontal epilepsy. And I will request my co-convenor, uh, Professor Kensuke, to uh, provide the last words before we close up this session. Okay, so uh, the thanks to uh, the uh, Dr. Eileen uh, McGonigal, and uh, the, uh, Dr. Uh, the Javnesha Laman, uh, the, as we expected, uh, the, the today's web webinar became uh, the very uh, uh, the interesting and uh, uh, the uh, uh, stimulating uh, the one, and I uh, we really uh, the uh, 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 thank uh, those two uh, the uh, great uh, the uh, invited uh, faculties uh, because you know uh, this is already uh, far beyond midnight. Uh, in uh, Australia. So I uh, really thank you uh, for your contribution uh, until this uh, late. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So much. Thank, you. thank you so much. I really learned a lot. Thank you. Me Bye -bye. too, Manjari. Thank you. Yeah. We too. Me Next too. Good case, sleep, Manjari. Okay. <laughs> Have a good Have sleep. A sorry, sorry to yeah. keep you awake so long. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, Professor Kida. Thank, Thank you, Kensuke. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Have a good uh, weekend. Have a good. Have a good okay. night. You yeah. too. Thank you.